know more such amazing stories from Indian history, click the bell icon and subscribe to Live History India. This fort with its iconic triple moat would have been a powerful symbol of authority way back in the 15th century when it was built for the new capital of the Bahamani Sultans in Bidar. While most are familiar with the Delhi Sultans of the north, the first Muslim dynasty in the south, the Bahamanis, remain an enigma. This is their story. Scholar and author Helen Fillon has spent decades studying the Bahamanis and how different influences came together under them to lay the foundation of a unique Dakani culture. The story of the Bahamanis starts further north in Dalatabad. Alauddin Khilji was the first Delhi Sultan to send raids deep into peninsular India. But it was Muhammad bin Tughlaq who famously moved his capital to the old Yadava capital of Devagiri, renaming it Dalatabad in 1328. This proved foolhardy and he had to retreat back to Delhi. The early forays by the Sultanate armies into the Deccan had one single motive. Loot, tribute, money. They would come to the Deccan, which was the land of promise, uh, take as much as they could, go back, mint their coins, uh, solve their economic problems and start again. But they were very wise that they did not stay here for very long. They did not stay in the Deccan for very long. Because uh, uh, committing yourself a whole into a kingdom is a different story than invading a kingdom and taking its riches. The first to do that were, of course, the Tuluks, who soon realized it was not such a good idea. And Mohammed Tuluk went back uh, to Delhi, leaving this group of, uh, of generals to fight and try and find a, a, a modus vivendi. And that's when the Bahmanis are born. But, um, and, and then, of course, we start having a state building of a state, building of a Deccani identity. Before it was Hindustan that was invading. Now you're beginning to have an identity that is Deccani. Mm -hmm. They say that the Bahmanis are, uh, are, are uh, Afghans, but it's not, we don't know. I mean, you know, it's both uh, could be Afghans, but they could be also um, um, uh, Hindu renegades. They could be Hindus that turned into Islam in order to uh, to get, to get the power they, they dreamt of having. Uh, obviously, we are dealing with a very intelligent, uh, strategic, with a strategic mind, uh, um, founder of the Bahmani kingdom, Alauddin. Uh, and it's interesting because our, our historians, they have two stories about him. Uh, the story which relates how he, he was a Brahmin and how the cobra came and, and, and sheltered his head you know, exactly what was happening to Buddha and a lot of others. And then, of course, you also have Alauddin, uh, who is seen as, as a leader by the Sufi community. Mm, so, absolutely. you know, so you have these two traditions that, that blend uh, to create. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think throughout the Bahmani kingdom, these two origins continue to, to interact. And that's why it's so interesting what's happening in the Deccan. And this continues with, the, with his successors, whether Adil Shahis, Qutub Shahis, uh, you know, they really are uh, continuing this dialogue between uh, different traditions, cultural traditions, concepts, kingship, you know, and each one adds and changes. The Bahamani dynasty was established by Alauddin, also known as Hassan Gangu, who is said to have been brought up by a Brahman. He was a general in the Tughlaq army who used the vacuum left behind to establish his own kingdom further south. The first capital of the Bahamanis was Dalatabad between 1347 and 1350, followed by Gulbarga between 1350 and 1430 and finally Bidar between 1430 and 1520. Bidar was strategically located at the centre surrounded by present-day Maharashtra Telangana and Karnataka. In Gulbarga, the early capital of the Bahamanis, you can still see the monuments of this period. What is interesting about Gulbarga is that it's a city without walls. It has no fortifications. The only fortified 
uh, area of Gulbarga is the fort. The two cities, the Gulbarga one, which is on the north west of, uh, of the fort, is uh, not enclosed, is open. And the south, the, the east, southeast, was the section that was devoted to funerary monuments. That's where you have around the lake, uh, which was a Kakati, I think, originally a, a water reservoir. Uh, there was the Darg of Gezu Daraz, Sheikh Mujarat, and the necropolis of the Bahmanis. The idea of building necropolises around water is not an Islamic idea. Mm. It's a, it's in, in India, death takes place by water. It's a tirta, it's a crossing, and that's what you have. And uh, Firusha was the, uh, the four, fifth Bahmani Sultan, is the one who introduces it. Mm. And from then on, all, all tombs are associated with either, uh, other, either uh, what reservoirs or bowries. And then later on, this is burrowed and taken on to the north, and you have the tomb of Humayun, and you have all these other um, monuments that are built next to water. There are two very, very interesting pieces of your own research which you've spoken to me about, and I'm very fascinated by. One is what was happening in the rest of the subcontinent and West Asia during this time of uh, you know kingdom making with the Bahamanis mm -hmm. and then the splinter because you had this entire area in turmoil and Deccan was a uh, was an island of sorts which which had its own dynamics take mm -hmm. us through it so um, this is the time Timur is in power in in northeast uh, Asia in Central Asia he has invaded Turkey he's uh, the whole area is in motion. Uh, people are uh, look, looking for new areas to, to find shelter, work, uh, food. And, and the Deccan is a protected. It was an area where, in fact, uh, was welcoming uh, all sorts of people. If, if you were an intellectual, an amazing craftsman, even more so, because uh, the, 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 the Deccanis were very keen at attracting the best. And uh, it, became, it was sort of the promised land uh, of the at the time. And the other place where, in fact, also you had a promised land is in Anatolia, in Turkey, present-day Turkey. So these are the two, the two areas of Asia that were attracting more and more uh, immigrants and foreigners. But they also opted for foreigners or immigrants that had talent. Mm -hmm. the, and that it became like, you know, even America uh, later on tried also to attract people with talent. And the Deccan did that. Mm -hmm. So you had the amazing craftsmen, amazing builders, uh, intellectuals, and they came and settled, and they were all welcome. And for the, De for, the, for the Deccanis, there was no really difference between the different immigrants, the different immigrant communities that came. The locals, however, did not, were not always very happy to have foreigners coming. But they coexisted as long as the sultans tried to be just and even with all their, uh, with all their uh, subjects, which was not always the case, mm. because the sultans would come under the influence of one community or the other, and then problems would, would rise. But in general, it was a community that coexisted. It was not... Uh, Where would they make their way? Because again, uh, it, it, it's very... Because Bidr is right in the heart of, of Peninsula yeah, India. Uh, yes. It's not next to a port or a... No. So what would their route have been? Well, and I think the, the, north, the north was uh, unusable. Uh, after the Tughlaqs, the north was in a disarray. We had no really rulers um, governing this part of India up until the Lod or the Sayyids and the Lodis come to power. So they would come mostly from the Persian Gulf. Mm. And, um, and that's why many, many, many Persians uh, or, Central, or Turks and Central Asians would come from, from Central Asia down to the Persian Gulf and then Chol and Dabol, which were the two main ports at the time. Goa was also a port, but the Goa soon came under Vijayanagar rule. So they lost it and came back to the Bahmanis uh, came back to the Bahmanis at the end of the 15th century when Mahmoud Gawan was the vizier. So most people came by sea. There were others that could have come um, after, from about the, the middle of the 15th century, from, um, from Bengal. Mm. We know that uh, we had horses coming to the Deccan from, from northeast. 
they might have had some immigration coming from that part as well. But the main, main Im 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 immigration centers was Chol and Dabol. In the 15th century, in its prime, Bidar was the place to be. A center of high culture and art, it attracted the greatest scholars, Sufi saints and artists of its time. Sadly, today all that remains of the Bahamanis are the monuments they left behind. There are no images of what they looked like, unlike the miniatures we have of later Deccan Sultanates, the Adil Shahis of Bijapur or the Nizam Shahs of Ahmednagar. Let's uh, give a face to some of these Bahamani rulers and exciting characters from history. Yes. Because we are so familiar with the, with the, Lo, with the Tughlaqs and the Lodis yes. and the Mughals, etc. But, you know, in, in public uh, knowledge, there's very little that we yes. know of these Deccan yes. Sultans. Yes. And let's start off with Alauddin. He really was a very shrewd strategist. He was able to manage to quieten uh, the different warring factions left by the Tughlaqs and unite them in order to create the Bahmanis. He was also very conscious of the importance of trade. So from the very beginning, he wanted to control Dabol and Chol, which he managed. And Goa also was under his control for a while, and then he lost it. So Alauddin seems to be a very intelligent strategist. Mm. Um, I don't know how he would have looked like. The ones I can imagine are other rulers of the Bahmanis. We have not because we have very d descriptions, but the monuments they left us are such that they give you an idea of what they would have looked like and what they would have liked. Mm. And for instance, Firusha Bahmani, who I think is one of the most important rulers of the Bahmani period, who ruled from 13, soon after Timur came, uh, 1398. Timur was conquering Delhi and he was being crowned and throned as a, as a, as a Sufi and as a king. Up to then, it was always a Sufi who put the crown on, uh, on, on the head of a king. Firusha took the crown and put it on his head. Oh, wow. So he doesn't need a Sufi. Mm. He, does, he's a, he, he already tells us that I'm going to be uh, both, both, both a spiritual leader and a temporal leader. Mm. So I imagine always Firusha being very intelligent unbelievably well read uh, and which uh, is something that really stands because he spoke I don't know how many languages he, he could speak the, the language of all of his wives and they were Georgians and I don't know from different parts of, of Asia um, he was interested in philosophy he was interested in astrology he wanted to build an observatory in Daulatabad but he never did because his astrologer died and he was an astrologer from Gilan he welcomed everybody who was knowledgeable and he considered knowledge the most important thing mm. uh, in any kingdom so uh, the, many of his uh, um, many of the people that he he interacted intellectually would say but you're a king how can you sit with us and he would say no knowledge has no rank mm. and we are all equal mm. uh, and to me this idea that in fact he was the one promoting knowledge, uh, and that for him, uh, the, if you have knowledge, you ha you're on the same rank as a king, is something, I think, amazing. And uh, I think that he built Firuzabad, his city, outside Gulbarga, south of Gulbarga. He built it as the place where he escaped after Gizudaraz came to, uh, to Gulbarga. Gizudaraz was a great Sufi but not a knowledgeable Sufi. Mm. He did not have the knowledge that, uh, that uh, uh, Firusha had. So after a while, Firusha was not interested in him. Mm. And, uh, but his brother, Ahmad Shah, became a follower of Gezuderaz, and you begin to have a more polarized Gulbarga. Gulbarga with problems between the local Dakinis and who were following Firusha and the Afakis who were following Ahmad Shah. The Bahamanis were Sunnis and had close ties with the Sufis who were popular and so gave them legitimacy. In Gulbarga, you will find the shrine of Hazrat Khwaja Banda Nawaz Gaizu Daraz, who is said to have brought Sufism to the south. But relations between the Bahamani sultans and the Sufi peers could get complicated. Firoz Shah, for instance, distanced himself from the order of Gaizu Daraz. 
while Ahmad Shah, who was a follower, later turned to Iran to invite a Sufi saint. In Bidar, you will find the Chokhandi, the mother of Hazrat Khalilullah from Iran. Eventually, Ahmad Shah was himself declared a saint. They moved to Bidar, and Ahmad Shah was a murid, was a follower of Gizu Daraz. The moment Gizu Daraz dies, he chooses as his, uh, as his, uh, as his spiritual uh, leader, a spiritual instructor, a, a, a Sufi that was in Kirman and was known as Shani Matula. Mm. Shani Matula was highly respected by the Mongol, the Turks and the Persian. And he invites Shani Matula to come and settle in Bidar. Mm. Shani Matula is too old, he can't come, but he sends his uh, grandson, Nirula. Mm. Nirula arrives with a crown that had the 12 gores of the Shia Imams and uh, Ahmad Shah is crowned saint by Shani Matula. And uh, um, at the same time, he had already been acknowledged as a magician and a saint by his people, because at the time the Deccan was going through a terrible drought. Mm -hmm. And he was a rainmaker. Oh. So uh, the rain came, he was, everybody felt happy and relieved that finally their land was accessible again, and they claimed that he was a saint. And then Shani Matula comes and, and confirms his sanctity. So the great tomb that we have in, uh, uh, in Bidar, in outside Bidar in Ashtur, I believe was built first as a shrine, as a, as a Hanukkah, mm. as, a, as a place where he could receive a Shani Matula who never came. As, as he was anointed also not only a saint, but as a Khalifa, as, a, as the one who could continue, the, he would be the representative of the Nimatullah sect in, uh, in the Deccan, he was buried there. Mm. Uh, and what for me is fascinating, and this is for me Deccan at its best, is that this shrine to this day is a shrine that is worshipped by both the Lingayats Really? And, and the Muslims, yes. So and why, why, why do the, the Lingayats go? were very important in trade. Mm. Uh, Lepakshi, for instance, was built, was built by Lingayat merchants. Mm. Uh, it was a few, you know, yeah. uh, 1540, I think is the... So the Lingayats were very, very important. It was a sect that was perhaps the most important Bhakti sect in, um, at the time yeah. in the Deccan. And uh, in the tomb of, of Ahmad Shah, the two come together. And I was so lucky two years ago, no, last year, I was, I was there when a Lingayat priest, a Lingayat Jingama, mm. uh, and a, a sheikh were, uh, were officiating at the same time at the tomb of Ahmad Shah, one with his shlokas, the other one with the Quran. Wow. And, the other, and, and this the, is a practice that still happens? Yes. Yes. The necropolis of Ashtur outside Bidar marks the resting place of Ahmad Shah and his descendants. Exquisitely made and embellished, the tomb of Ahmad Shah is a pilgrimage site and represents one of the finest examples of Dakani art. As do other monuments in and around Bidar. From the Chokhandi of Hazrat Khalilullah adjoining Ashtur, to the many monuments within the formidable and extensive fort of Bidar, like the multi-pillared mosque, the Tarkash Mahal, and the exquisitely embellished Rangin Mahal, with its intricate woodwork and inlays. The Bahamani Empire reached its pinnacle in the late 15th century. By this time, as important as the Sultan of Bidar was a vizier, Mahmud Gawan, who built his famous madrasa here. By the 16th century, however, the Bahamanis were on the wane and the real power was rested in the hands of the Georgian minister Ali Barid. The Bahamani Empire eventually split into five kingdoms, Bijapur, Ahmadnagar, Berar, Golconda and Bidar, where the Baridis held fort. Bidar continued to be an important centre until the city fell to the Mughal Aurangzeb. But during the Bahmani period and during the Baridi period as well. And also the Adil Shahis, the Adil Shahis also respected Bidar as they did with Gulbarga. 
um, it remained a great cultural center. Suffice to see the monuments and you realize how important. It is. And I think the city, Bidar, was divided into sections because you already, um, I mentioned earlier, that I believe Bidar was built for the Afakis as the inimical relations were growing in Gulbarga, so Ahmad Shah tried to separate the two. So they came, uh, the, the Afakis beca became an Afaki city, and Bidar became a great center. And Ahmad Shah gives tremendous importance to trade. We had, it's the first time that we have a min minister, I mean, someone who is Malik al Tujar, which is the, the king of merchants in charge, mm. obviously, of, of commercial relations. But he was also a very close friend of Ahmad Shah Wali. And Mahmoud Gawan is also Malik al Tujar. Mm. Uh, and his son uh, succeeds. Um, Ahmad, um, Mahmoud Gawan is Malik al Tujar. So tremendous importance is given to, to trade, and that's why the Lingayats also come into it. So tell me, what's the legacy of, of, uh, of uh, the Bahamanis and the Barid Shahs today? Because so little remains of them. I mean, much of it has been erased, of course, there's fabulous monuments. But what do you, as a historian who studied them so closely, what do you think is the legacy of them? I think their legacy is lost because. In the meantime, Aurangzeb came, and then the whole thing broke into different little groups. But then that's why it's important to study them. Because in the world we live, what, what the Deccan was is what we would like to have everywhere. Because it was a, a series of tolerant kingdoms where, in fact, knowledge was worshipped, um, beauty was considered uh, an expression of spirituality. Um, so, you know, all and, and the, everybody coexisted. I mean, you know, different nations, groups, language, they were all together. Dakini was a very important form of, uh, of uh, a, a very, a, a linguistically, a very important language where poetry was written uh, already from the reign of Ahmad Shah. You start having Dakini poems and Dakini stories. So, uh, you know, all this was. Uh, Dakin was a, a language of a, com a, a language that combined other languages of the of the Deccan and of course also um, uh, elements from Urdu from the north. Mm. But uh, it's it's what the Deccan should, is telling us is we can live together. We don't live. We don't need to uh, to separate. We don't need to to frame to to compact to little, little um, divisions. Um, but right now, this is not what's happening. And uh, I think that uh, with the Mughals, this was lost. Mm. Tell me, uh, what remains of, of that artistic legacy? There is the Bidri art, for instance. Yes, which you still it's, have, actually. Yeah, so yeah. Tell, tell me, how, how when you see Bidri art in the original, and yeah. I'm not talking about what you see yes. over today, how does that remind you of, you know, Rangin Mahal could have been, some parts of it do look like... Uh, you know, well, I mean, the idea yeah. of inlaying one material in another is something that first, we have it first on cannons, mm. on Baridi cannons, and it, they were inlaid in gold mm. or silver. And I think this is the first evidence of inlay on two different materials. And of course, the, the second and most impressive is the, uh, the mother of pearl on basil, uh, which was never repeated after that. Mm. Um, and I think Bidri belongs to the same tradition. And you still have good, very good Bidri work being done in Bidar, mm. even now. Uh, but we don't have, for instance, miniatures uh, or paintings from the, or paintings important uh, uh, remains, except for the tomb of Ahmad Shah. Mm. And you also have on the, on the Madras of Mahmoud Gawan, uh, part uh, of the uh, sections were painted, mm. not just tiled which shows also that, in fact, the two uh, uh, painting and tiles were coexisted and the monument could have both. Uh, we don't have it in many places. The only uh, Madras of Mahmoud Gawan combines the two. Mm. In the tomb of Ahmad Shah has just painting. There's no uh, okay. tiles. Uh, the tomb of his son, Alauddin, you have tiles on one wall. And according to Yazdani, who was one of the great uh, um, uh, students uh, of, uh, of Bachmani and Dekani art. He was, uh, uh, he was the, the head of the archaeological department under the Nizams. Apparently the tomb of Alauddin was painted inside. Mm. Uh, so you, could, you would have had the two were combined. Um, 
they, I think their cities must have been, the Bidar must have been quite a city because I, 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 I really imagine. It's a large, it's large, a large city. Uh, area. Yes. There's a lot of monuments, uh, 30 odd yeah. monuments within that, uh, and more, mm, more, much more, more much more. more. You, as a scholar, went, study, went into the Deccan, studied it, and then you set up, helped set up the Deccan Foundation, yes, which yes, you Deccan, uh, yeah. set up with George Mitchell. Tell me, uh, what was the mandate of that? And are you, uh, what are you, what are your, what's your vision for it? Will My you? vision is that the DHF uh, will preserve as many monuments as possible, create awareness, that's more important than even the monuments because we are going to go at some point, but the new generation should be aware of the value of these monuments and that they should, be pre they should preserve them. It's their heritage, it's their identity, and they have to preserve it because otherwise they will lose, they won't be the same people anymore. Uh, so my, my, I really hope that in fact we can create this awareness that is so much needed and for that we're publishing guidebooks, we, we, do, um, we, we prepare programs for young students and schools, uh, we do as much as we can but also resources are, uh, are a problem because at the moment it's mostly the trustees of the foundation that, that try and do as much as they can. Um, but I think there is so much to do in the Deccan and the monuments are of such importance because they are not repeated anywhere else. You look at the Mughals and the same thing is repeated everywhere, not with the, not with the Deccanis. Every monument has a different identity, tells us a different story, describes a different ruler. It, it, they're really quite unique. Go to Gulbarga and Bidar and you will find remnants of its past glory. Sadly, many of the monuments are in a bad state. The exquisite tomb of Ahmed Shah Wali needs restoration. Many of the domes of the tombs in the complex have just fallen off. The great madrasa of Mahmud Gawan stands forlorn and the expansive fort needs serious upkeep. It is a pity that these monuments, symbols of an important era, and the birth of the syncretic Dakani culture that evolved and flourished from here are not being given more attention. <laughs>